From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and coming up today, K-State's Kelsey Anderson will talk about deciding on the use of a fungicide seed treatment when planting wheat this fall. She'll outline the situations where treated seed will benefit you growers, and she'll tell about new information for you in the updated version of K-State's Wheat Seed Treatment publication. Then from the Kansas Forest Service at K-State, Aaron Yoder announces that tree and shrub orders for fall planting will soon be taken by the Conservation Tree Planting Program. He'll talk about what's been added to the list of plant material available this fall. Later on, this week's horticulture segment where K-State's Ward Upham will go over the steps to succeeding with a cool season lawn planting this fall. It's all here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome once again to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Well, once more, another wheat planting season in Kansas approaches. And our topic here is perfectly aligned with that. That is wheat seed treatments for disease protection and considerations on whether or not to invest in such a crop input as part of wheat planting time management. Along with us once more is wheat disease specialist Kelsey Anderson of K-State Research and Extension. And this is the proverbial annual question that producers bring up, Kelsey, and that is... Is it worthwhile economically and agronomically to purchase treated seed or to treat saved back seed on farm? And there are more than a few factors to weigh here, you say. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me here, Eric. Um, and that's a good question. I think the thing to remember about seed treatments is they're, they're not a magic bullet, so they won't automatically give five bushels per acre. But we look at them more like insurance, where the seed treatments... They, they should pay off and they will protect us from some big losses. So they'll protect against some of these seaborne diseases that can accumulate and cause um, infections year after year that can lead to price discounts. And they protect against some of those emergence issues, which might bite away at our yield. I think there's some work by my colleague, Romulo Lolato, that has shown that they, they at least pay off 50% of the time. So there should be should be a, a good chance of breaking even after several years of application, and particularly if we have some of those seaborne disease issues in our field. Also thinking about what should be factored into this decision, should one take their cues from the disease pressure that was evident in the most previous growing season, the one we just concluded? Yeah, I think that's, that's one key thing to think about. So especially if there were issues in this past season of common bunt or loose smut, or there were some emergence issues that we noticed, those fields are going to be high, high priorities for seed treatments. Also fields that might've had some fusarium head blight and that seed was saved back. Those fields might have some emergence issues, might have some of that seed-borne fusarium still lingering. So those fields with some previous disease history would be a high target for a potential payoff of a seed treatment this year. Now, there were, conversely, a great number of fields that did not have major disease issues. That might lead a producer into thinking that a seed treatment would not be necessary this year. But would you prefer that producers keep those seasons separate in that respect and and consider a seed treatment? Yeah, good question. So especially if that seed is saved, I think that would be a good consideration for a seed treatment. Of course, you can check your seed germination. So that could help kind of play into that decision about whether seed treatment is appropriate or not. And if that seed was just purchased this year, so if it's um, new seed and it's certified disease-free, we might think that that would be 
a lower priority for a seed treatment. However, that might be the crop that we want to protect. So that's part of that decision balance. I think seed treatments in general, and, and just from some of the research that I've seen, they do provide a lot of bang for your buck. So they protect you against a large number of diseases without costing too terribly much per acre. So I think even in a clean seed lot, um, they can still provide some protection, but those would be lower priorities for those seed treatments. In a recent article in the e-update newsletter out of the Department of Agronomy here at K-State, this topic was taken up, and one of the comments in it was that if one is intending to plant wheat late, particularly following a row crop like soybeans, that seed treatments might pay their way in an even greater fashion here. You might speak to that. Yeah, so those cool, wet soils that we're planting into late are really favorable for some of these soil-borne diseases and some of these seed-borne diseases. So in those cases, to really aid in that establishment and prevent some of those soil-borne diseases from kind of getting a foothold that really like that cool, wet soil, that's when we're really going to want to think about those seed treatments. And one thing I want to point out is that not every seed treatment is the same. So some seed treatments um, have only fungicides. Some seed treatments have multiple fungicides. Some have a fungicide plus an insecticide. And some even have plant growth regulators. So it's important to understand what's on our seed and to match that to the disease pressure on farm. I think the best bet is typically to get a seed treatment with um, at least two or more of those fungicide products because they will protect against different different diseases. So we kind of hedge our bets against a couple different problems. That early um, season protection against insects, that can stave off some of that, for example, barley yellow dwarf, um, if we can protect against those those early aphid populations. So it's also important not only if we've used a seed treatment or not, but to make sure we're using the right products on our seed. And oftentimes we focus so much on those seed-borne diseases, but seed treatments can pay dividends against foliar diseases as well, as one considers that product selection. Yep, absolutely. So it's we always think that seed treatments probably don't last more than 30 days. So they really protect that early emerging seedling, but they're not going to provide protection, for example, all the way to the spring. But they can suppress that early season establishment of powdery mildew, sometimes of other foliar diseases like rusts that might establish early. So, so it does provide some protection early in the season, some suppression of those, those foliar diseases, which can lead to a lower epidemic when it comes to the spring. So that's, that's another kind of benefit that we might get out of our seed treatment. There are several other seedling diseases like Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Fusarium that might sneak in and, and cause um, low emergence. So usually seed treatments can protect against those as well. Consider all of that. There was another question that came up in that same article in the e-update. Some producers may be a bit hesitant to use seed treatments because they don't want to have leftover seed treated, which may have limited use. And there is a way of getting around that if one considers it, you say. Sure. So there are some options to treat smaller batches. There are some um, hopper box type treatments that could be used to treat a, a smaller batch of seed. We also recommend that you could if you're going to, going to use the same variety, you could save that seed for an additional year. So save back that seed if there's extra treated seed and use that in, in the next season, that seed treatment should still be effective. So um, there are some options there uh, to make sure we don't have any of that extra leftover treated seed that, of course, couldn't go for grain sales. Right. Well, we want to refer folks to an extension publication that's out from K-State. It's actually been available for a time, but it was just freshly updated, appropriately titled Seed Treatment Fungicides for Wheat Disease Management, and you had a hand in adding new information to this. What's available in that respect to growers now, Kelsey? Yep, so we went through and we updated that um, there's a table in there that gives just some of the common seed treatments and we've updated them. They're usually refreshed maybe with new ingredients or new rates um, year after year. So that's been updated. We've also added a, a little more information about what each of the ingredients means in our seed treatment, as well as some steps to success 
for a good seed treatment application. So we want good coverage. We want to make sure we don't have a sporadic body coverage, and we want to protect all of those seeds. So, so we tried to add a few more tips and tricks about seed treatment success in that document. Yeah. So I would I would refer people to take a peek uh, and see what's new there. Now we sh- and you mentioned it right there. We don't want to overlook the importance of application and thoroughness of that application. That means everything to this project succeeding, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think some of the, the stories of seed treatment not succeeding as much as we hope it, it would are really due to that inadequate coverage. So we want to make sure all the seeds are treated and that the entire seed is treated because really that seed treatment is only protecting each individual plant. So to get the maximum um, out of our investment, we want to make sure that we have uniform coverage. Well, as with any aspect of wheat management, fungicide seed treatments should be considered carefully before one invests and then how one employs those seed treatments appropriately. This K-State publication, quite helpful in all those respects. It also lists 10 treatment products and rates them for their effectiveness against seed-borne diseases, seedling diseases, root rots, and in the cases where it applies, grazing restrictions. How long one would have to wait post-application before turning cattle out on that wheat? Again, all in this newly revised K-State write-up, Seed Treatment Fungicides for Wheat Disease Management 2020. It's in the K-State Research and Extension online bookstore. So simply search for it, and it's easy to find. Timely information indeed, Kelsey, as always, and we appreciate your comments. Thanks for joining us once more. Great. Thanks for having me. She's Kelsey Anderson, Wheat Disease Specialist, K-State Research and Extension, with a host of considerations for you producers on wheat seed treatments as we approach planting time ever so steadily here in Kansas. And we'll be back with more here on this Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. On this segment, we bring you up to date on the Conservation Tree Planting Program out of the Kansas Forest Service here at Kansas State University, because that program will be launching its fall tree and shrub sales period very soon now. In fact, Tuesday, September the 1st. And joining us is the conservation tree specialist from the service, Aaron Yoder. Aaron, first of all, we need to remind folks of the, the nature of the program here. It is to support conservation tree and shrub plantings in the state. Yep, that's right. So we have... Uh a number of different purposes that these seedlings serve for, um, including things like farmstead or livestock windbreaks, also riparian plantings along streams and rivers. A lot of folks use uh, these seedlings for wildlife habitat enhancement, that sort of a thing. The minimum, we offer these these seedlings in units of 25. So the seedlings are grown in a 2-inch diameter, 7-inch long container, and so they're relatively small. You wouldn't want to bring a a large truck to pick up a a unit of 25 of these trees. A trunk of a small (laughs) hatchback would probably suffice. So a misconception that happens from time to time. Someone will show up with a truck and trailer and uh, be a little bit taken aback when they realize that they could have fit in the in the front seat of their car. These are seedlings. They are seedlings, all. yep. And exclusively container grown, sold yep. in the fall. You do add new species to the list, which we'll talk about here, but the question arises, why would one want to opt for a fall planting of this material as opposed to waiting until the springtime? There are good reasons for the fall approach, aren't there? There are, yeah. I think in, in Kansas especially and in a lot of other areas of the Midwest, um, one of the things that people encounter during the springtime is, first of all, soil temperatures are slowly increasing. Um, you know, the air temperatures might be suitable to plant seedlings 
but the the soil temperatures are still come April maybe fifty degrees, and they're wet. You know, it's very wet. It's hard to to get out into the field and actually get the plants in the ground, especially if you're trying to plant a lot of seedlings, large quantities. So that's where fall planting is has benefits. You know, the soil temperatures sixty to seventy degrees come September. Those plant roots are going to start growing immediately. They're not going to just be sitting there. And as long as, you know, you're able to water and control the weeds, those seedlings are going to get off to a good start, even though they're appearing to go dormant, you know, prior to the winter time. But as long as those soil temperatures are above 40 degrees, which can be the case into December even, you know, those, those plant roots are going to grow. And fewer pest issues as well. Fewer pest typically. issues, yeah, and, and weeds too. Weed control becomes a lot easier in the fall. The seedlings also have lower moisture demands. You know, they're not going to be actively utilizing water resources the same way. You know, they've, they've lost their leaves. Their tissues have lignified to some extent. And so that's another one of the other benefits of fall planting. So a lot of people, it's just one of those anecdotal things I think I run across a lot is People just say, yeah, I've had a lot of success planting in the fall. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we're trying to offer more and more species in the fall. Typically, we've had a lot of just conifers in the past, and we're adding a couple each year trying to do that. And right now, our focus is kind of on the shrubs. So trying to get more stuff out in the fall. And to that point, you've added a couple of new species to the conservation shrub part of the order list. We have, yeah. So we have two new species of native shrubs. Uh, one of them is rusty black haw viburnum. It's native to the to the southeastern part of the of the state. It's relatively challenging to get it to seed to germinate, but we've been working on testing out some different stratification treatments on that seed to get it to pop. And and we've got a number of units available this fall. So that's a good. A good native shrub. It flowers um, heavily in the spring. It's a good resource for pollinators and also other types of insects and other wildlife. Produces a fruit that's edible and provides cover and, and food resources for other songbirds, that sort of thing, too. So that's one species. And the other one is New Jersey tea. So that's a more of an upland shrub that we actually see from time to time here in the the Flint Hills area, kind of the eastern half of the state where its native range is. You know, if you look up a lot of the pollinator lists, New Jersey tea is almost always on on those lists. It's just the floral resources that it produces in the way of nectar and pollen are a big attraction for a lot of insect pollinators. And so that's really the driver for us in, in producing that. And in discussions with some of the district foresters, they're ideas to kind of incorporate this to add diversity to something like a windbreak planting and really enhance that wildlife value of conservation planting that they might be planting. So 34 species this year and up to eight shrubs. So the selection is broader than ever for the fall planting program. These are low-cost tree seedlings, to remind. And there is a change in the procedure that you wanted to note, Aaron, and that is these will be delivered by shipping only as opposed to the option of picking up the orders. Yeah, that's a uh, a change that we have had to make somewhat hastily in the spring. Um, we moved to a ship-only policy, and that's really just to, to minimize the amount of traffic that we're having. Um, it's unfortunate because I really enjoy getting to chat with folks, you know, from all over the state as they come to pick up their seedlings, really really actually learn a lot from, from those conversations with people. Yeah, but this and is a product of the pandemic. It is, yes. Yeah. Yep. So we are strictly going to be shipping out. All orders are going to be shipped. Well, the easiest way to go about browsing through the selection of material and then placing an order is at the website? It is, yeah. Yeah. So the website is www.kansasforests.org. Oftentimes, if we have a lot of orders being placed, you know, it's also helpful to to give our front office staff a call. They are working remotely, by and large, but are still able to field calls and, and place orders. So the number is one eight eight seven four zero eight seven three three. 
Yeah. 888-740-8733 is the number, or, of course, you can find that at kansasforest.org. Before we let you go, you note something else that you and your team, as part of the Conservation Tree Planting Program operation, are actually collecting seed this fall. We are, yes. So that's something that um, in previous years we have done to a, a pretty limited extent with black walnut, um, a species here or there. But we have some interesting projects that are being kind of investigated by some of our riparian foresters wanting to actually look at directly seeding tree and shrub seed compared to some of the other plant material like the bare root or containerized seedlings. So um, that, in addition to needing to... Um, find seed for a lot of these new species that we are growing now in our container program. It's really pushed us to, to actually ramp up our seed collection efforts. And so we've, we've been adding to our repertoire each fall some new collection sites, identifying um, a lot of these hardwood trees, a lot of the different oak species around the primarily the Riley and Pot and Geary County area, but also we have some folks that collect in other parts of the state, too. So bringing that up, if a landowner out there would happen to have such resources and would be willing to part with those as part of this seed collection program, you would welcome a contact from them? Absolutely, yeah. And in fact, we've had um, we've had a lot of contacts with landowners. You know, they'll notice that they have a tree or a number of trees that are productive, usually walnuts or acorns. And, you know, what do I do with all these? Can you guys use this this sort of thing? And so we're glad to, you know, especially emailing pictures is really helpful to the Forest Service or myself. Yeah, we are in definitely in a phase of seed collection where we're we're trying to identify good collection sites. And, you know, we had a, a pretty late freeze this year that pretty much wiped out all of the black walnut from the sites that we typically collect from. And so we're definitely going to be looking for black walnut and bur oak especially because they're not productive, at least where we've been collecting. So we're hoping if we can expand our collection network, you know, to other parts of the state that might insulate us from some of those environmentally related issues that happen every spring. And Spread the risk. Yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be that would be great. If anyone ever has any uh, productive trees on their land, that'd be, we'd be more than happy to come out and take a look at it or we'd see if we couldn't come collect it ourselves even. So, Excellent. Yep. Once more, kansasforests.org has all of that contact information as well as the Order procedures for the Conservation Tree Planting Program. The fall order season begins this coming Tuesday, September the 1st. It'll run through October the 15th. So if you have a conservation project that you would like to get going this fall for windbreaks, wildlife habitat, woodlots, riparian plantings, what have you, do look into what this program has to offer. Aaron, as always, thanks for coming over. We appreciate this update. Thank you, Eric. He is the Conservation Tree Specialist with the Kansas Forest Service. That's Aaron Yoder with us on Agriculture Today. And we'll have more on the K-State Radio Network. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and over we go now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, of course, the center of attention today, Hurricane Laura. It pounded the Gulf Coast with ferocious wind and torrential rainfall, unleashing a wall of seawater pushing inland as the Category 4 storm roared ashore earlier today in Louisiana and near the Texas border. It has since been downgraded to a Category 2 storm now. 
From the agricultural perspective, the storm is ravaging crops along that track inland after making landfall early this morning near Lake Charles, Louisiana. The hurricane's track is most threatening to crops in the Delta, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, the Missouri Boot Heel, and western Tennessee. Now, Louisiana is 40 percent bowls open on its cotton crop. Arkansas, about 23 percent bowls open. The other cotton fields are just emerging in that region. Cotton has also sustained hurricane damage on the South Texas coast earlier this season. Most of the coastal cotton down around the Brownsville, Corpus Christi area was pummeled by Hurricane Hannah earlier in the season. Now, further north, the rainfall from the remnants of Hurricane Laura after it made landfall may benefit a portion of the Midwest, especially the southern portion of the region. A frontal boundary will work its way south through the Midwest, and the combination of Laura and that front could bring moderate to heavy rainfall east of the Mississippi River. Here's more on that from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. As areas in the path of Hurricane Laura brace for impact, one area to watch is the Mississippi Delta. Now, from a Delta standpoint, it is fortunate that the hurricane is moving in further to the west along the Texas-Louisiana border. Even so, we do expect to see some heavy squalls, high winds, locally heavy rain. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says this could threaten mature crops that have not yet been harvested. That would include the rice in the Mississippi Delta, as well as soybeans, which are starting to drop leaves and just getting the harvest underway. Other crops include sugarcane. Some of the concerns that we saw in 2005 with Hurricane Rita included lodging or knocking over of the sugarcane stalks, as well as some saltwater intrusion. Meanwhile, nearly 40 percent of Louisiana's cotton bowls are open. All of that cotton, if hit by high winds and heavy rains, could suffer degradations in quality. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And time will tell on the full extent of that damage. Uh, Second installment of farmer payments via the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program is still on tap to be unveiled in early September, according to USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue. In a briefing with reporters, the secretary was asked about how USDA would be utilizing that additional $14 billion in authority available to the agency under the Commodity Credit Corporation. The additional CCC monies will be used in the CFAP2 according to Purdue. While there has been pressure on the USDA for the dates it used to determine payments under the initial CFAP effort, the secretary suggested one reason for that April 15th cutoff was to get money out quickly. He said the USDA is looking at the cutoff going forward, also highlighting moves by the department to cover more commodities under the program, and the recent decision issuing the final 20 payments, 20 percent of payments, that is, to producers under the initial CFAP. CFAP effort. Information on the second CFAP effort could come very shortly after Labor Day, according to Secretary Perdue. And the consumers uh, caught up break at the grocery store as food at uh, home prices were down 1%. In July, compared with June, even though they're still up an average of 3% so far this year compared with 2019, even as food prices have fluctuated, the USDA's Economic Research Service still forecasts the consumer price index for food at home will increase from 2.5% to 3.5% here in 2020 versus last year, and that was unchanged from their month-ago outlook. Food away from home, i.e. restaurants, rose a half a percent in July from the June level, according to the ERS, and up an average of 2.4 percent for all of 2020. The USDA forecasts an increase there of one and a half to two and a half percent. Overall, food prices forecast to rise two to three percent in 2020 from 2019 levels. Coming your way next on Agriculture Today, this week's Kansas soybean update. With that is Greg Akagi. Greg. Kerry Weefald, Agriculture Marketing Director with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, joins us. And Kerry, the 2020 Kansas Ag Growth Summit in a virtual form recently took place. And we couldn't be happier with the results that we've had. This past year, we looked at opportunities to continue promoting agriculture in the many sectors that economically contribute to our state's vitality, starting on July 20th and wrapping up on August 20th. The Department of Agriculture hosted 17 virtual sessions focusing on everything 
from pet food to the wheat industry to the specialty crop and livestock industry. We hosted three crossover sessions highlighting agriculture's voice in state initiatives, protecting our supply chain, and then also international trade. And then we came together on August 20th to have a virtual summit that brought many aspects from the sector sessions and the crossover sessions into an actual summit. The governor was able to deliver a message, as was Secretary Beam. And then our special guest was Ken Isley, who's the administrator of the USDA Foreign Agriculture Service. That was a real treat having him talk about about Kansas commodities grown in local communities, but having an impact on the global market. We had more than 1,200 participants this year and 165 panelists and speakers that participated in at least one session. And you had a good session on soybeans and other oil seeds as well. The beauty of ag growth is that we pull together farmers, ranchers, agribusinesses, commodity commissions, and we talk freely about what it might take to continue supporting that specific crop or that specific industry, and then what can be done to help advance the special interest, whether that's further processing, transportation, how do we enhance support for programs designed to benefit farmers, ranchers, and agribusinesses, not only on the local level, but advocating in Topeka with our state legislature and making sure Kansas has a seat at the table if we're going global. And this year, we offered for the first time a voluntary Ag Heroes program where people across the state could not nominate someone in their community who's gone above and beyond during this time of COVID to help their community. So this year we recognized for the first time, we called them Ag Heroes. So we had 10 Kansans or groups of Kansans, because we had a 4-H club in there, recognized for their good efforts and their good deeds in their communities. And then we also had 12 honorable mentions. That's Gary Weefall, the Agriculture Marketing Director with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Agriculture Today returns now, and Mike's side once more is K-State horticulturist Ward Upham. He's in for our weekly horticulture segment. And although you couldn't tell it by our recent weather, we are encroaching upon the fall season now. And in fact, those of you intending to seed or reseed a cool season lawn, that project, Ward tells us, can commence any time now. But as we've discussed many a time in the past, Ward... Success in planting a cool season lawn in the fall is all about the preparation. It is. You've got to have certain things in order for you to be successful. If you do these things, you're going to be fine. That's going to be good fertilization, use the proper rates, have even dispersal of the seed, good seed to soil contact, and proper watering. Let's take those up individually. The starter fertilization for a newly seeded cool season lawn. What is necessary here, typically? Yeah, so what you want to use is a starter fertilizer. And you will find that certain fertilizers listed as starter fertilizers. Actually, anything with that second number, which is the amount of phosphorus, if it's higher than the other two, that's what you want. And if it's listed as a starter fertilizer, that's what it will be. So just apply that according to the recommendations on the bag, and that will get the grass seed up a little bit quicker and get a good root system under it. Seeding rates, that's a frequent question from homeowners as to just how thick to put that seed on. Yes, and so for tall fescue, you're usually looking at six to eight pounds per thousand square feet. Kentucky bluegrass, two to three pounds per thousand square feet. So knowing that and knowing how much area you need to cover, that can uh, help you determine how much seed you actually need to buy. And good grass seed is not cheap, so that's something you really do need to know. And you don't need to waver very far from those ranges. That's right. Actually, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that in shade, you should put on more. And in shade, you put on less because you have less light 
and you put in higher rate of seed and you have more competition between those seedlings and it can actually cause that planting to fail. So if you're in shade, you put on about half as much seed as what we recommended. So that would be three to four pounds of tall fescue and one to one and a half pounds of bluegrass in the shade. Hmm. Uh, But if you're in the sun, you're going to use the full rate. But as important as seeding rates, and maybe even more so, is that seed-to-soil contact. That has to be achieved. That has to be achieved. If you just scatter seed on top of the soil, you're not going to have good luck. It has to have good seed-soil contact. The way you get that is what you use in order to seed. If you need to till, you know, if you have an area that's rough and you need to smooth it out or you need to change the contour of the soil, you're going to have to till. But normally you do not. You know, if everything's fairly good, you don't have to till. But if you do, you're going to have to firm that soil once you till. It's too fluffy once you get done. A roller is probably what is recommended most. Some people just use a lawn tractor and go over it in order to get it to settle down. And then you spread the seed. And then you need to work it in. And you don't need to work it in deep. You you just use a leaf rake. And that'll kind of mix it into that soil enough so it'll germinate. You're still going to have some on top. Don't worry about that. But you need to have some that is actually covered. Now, that's the most aggressive approach, tilling and seeding in that fashion. But there are other alternatives that may be, if nothing else, a little less labor intensive here. That's right. And really, my second choice, actually my first choice, if you don't need to till, is a slit seeder. And that is something that will dig furrows in the ground and drop the seed in one operation. Does a really good job. You have these little rows of uh, seedlings coming up that will fill in. Just be sure to go two ways. If you go one way, often you may get a skip or two. Go two ways, you're less likely to get that, and it will fill in quicker. Go about right angles to what you went the first time if you can. If you can't, just make sure it's not exactly the same way. And if you can't somehow obtain a slit seeder, there's the verticutter as an alternative here. That's right. Verticut and a power rake are two different things. Power rake has little hammers that are loose, and so that when they swing, they'll pull up thatch. They're not made for this operation. Verticut has little blades that cut into the soil and, again, make furrows. And so you're going to verticut once, broadcast your seed, verticut a second time, again at different angles than we went the first time, and that should do it. That'll get all that seed in good contact with the soil, and uh, it will come up. It's a little more labor-intensive just because you're doing two operations instead of one, but still, it works well. And yet one more tool that might be employed here, the core aerator, which is often used for overseeding a lawn. But if you're starting from scratch, this is a possibility as well? Yes, you can. Especially useful if you're on a slope where you're afraid it's going to wash. Then core aerating helps hold that seed in place while it comes up. Or if you have a, a lawn that you're not tilling, but it is very compacted. If it's compacted, going over that uh, with a core aerator about three times in different directions and then broadcasting your seed works well. The third advantage of core aeration is those seeds fall into those holes and it doesn't take as much water to get them up and going because those little holes protect the soil moisture. In any event, make sure you accomplish that seed-to-soil contact sufficiently, and then the next step is equally vital, and that is providing enough moisture at the outset for emergence. That's right, and what you want to do is keep that soil moist. Now, if you go at this time of year when it's so hot, you may be watering three times a day. You're not watering deep. You're just keeping that surface of that soil moist so that seed can germinate. And that seed, since that soil is so warm, will come up very quickly. I've had tall fescue up in four days at this time of year. If you get a little bit later, it's going to be more like a week or maybe even 10 days, depending on how cool that soil is. But you're going to have to keep that soil moist. If you delay and go uh, with your seeding operation later, you won't have to be that often. Maybe once a day, maybe once every couple of days, depending on what the weather is. But keep it moist, and then once it come up, Don't stop watering. People will see it come up and then they totally stop. You can't do that. You have to gradually back off. And so you may go instead of every day, go every other day. The way to check that is to use your hand to push down on that new grass. If it springs right back up, it's got enough water. If it doesn't, if it stays laid down, then you need to get some water on it. It's not going to be brown yet. It's going to be green. But it's not recovering very quickly, and so then you need to water. So eventually you're going to get to the point where you're putting, where you're watering maybe once a week. 
So don't skip any of those steps. And if you need more information on fall lawn seeding, of course, the Horticultural Information Center out of K-State that Ward oversees can help you out with those. As always, Ward, many thanks to you for coming over. You bet. That's Ward Upham, horticulturist, K-State Research and Extension. And with us on this week's Horticulture segment, capping off our Thursday edition. As always, thanks for joining us. Please be back here this same time tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.